with ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 7, getting results. My son was shot in the, in the club in the polls in Orlando, and he's still in the bathroom when he's bleeding. The way he died, he didn't deserve it. None of them deserve to die the way they did. It's just scary. It's a scary situation. Devilish laugh, and he was just walking around, just shooting people randomly. These people were just trying to be themselves, and they just, it's just so sad. I have seen some horrible things in my city. I have also seen the power of love in Orlando. From hurt to healing, today we mark five years since the Pulse Massacre. Men and women, gay and straight, all died together at the nightclub on South Orange Avenue in downtown Orlando. And tonight we are honoring their legacies, five years after the darkest night in Central Florida's history. Good evening to you. I'm Eric Von Hagen. Glad you're with us tonight. The 49 people who died, their names will live on forever. Amanda, Lisa, and Bear. Mercedes Marisol Flores. 49 bells for the 49 lives ringing across downtown Orlando this afternoon. We want to take a live look now at Pulse, where the remembrance ceremony is just about starting. Speakers will include survivors of the shooting, faith leaders, as well as city and county leaders. We are streaming the entire ceremony live on ClickOrlando.com for you through 8 p.m. And we have live team coverage of the ceremony in the Day of Remembrance. News Six's Nadine Giannis is at the Dr. Phillips front yard where the general public will be able to watch the ceremony. And Troy Campbell is at Pulse. We start with Troy. What is it like there tonight, Troy? Well, good evening, Eric. A very somber moment here. So the ceremony is just beginning here behind me, and it's actually taking place in the roadway that they have closed down for this ceremony. The group here seated a group of survivors, family members, first responders, officers who were some of the first ones to respond here, who actually went on to develop relationships with some of these victims. And taking a look around in this crowd is also U.S. Congresswoman Val Demings, her husband, Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings. We do expect to hear from Pulse owner Barbara Poma and others uh, with the One Pulse Foundation. This year, extra important for a lot of people involved, they say because of last year, ceremonies were forced to be virtu virtual because of the pandemic. Uh, so this year, very important that everyone is able to come together. There will also be a reading of all 49 names of all of the victims here. We do expect to hear a very emotional speech from community members and again, survivors. And we will be here and we'll continue to bring it to you, Eric. All right, Troy, we'll talk to you again very soon. A much larger crowd at the Dr. Phillips front yard across the street from Orlando City Hall. Anyone who wants can go there for that. Nadine, how is it there? Well, it's first come, first serve, Eric, and there was a line to get into the front yard here at the Dr. Phillips Center of Performing Arts by 515 today of people who were ready to take the trauma from five years ago and again turn it into healing by coming together. This is where we got the title Orlando United with those images from right here at the Dr. Phillips Center and from Lake Eola of thousands raising up their candles lit. Definitely a powerful moment that we are expecting here at the Dr. Phillips Center tonight as they will be streaming the memorial on a screen behind me as you see from Pulse. And I would imagine that the, the same way that it was five years ago, this scene as the families are gathering at Pulse, as that is sacred, hollow ground as they just said, this is the force field of, of support for those families. We are told that some of the families, frankly, could not go to Pulse even five years later. So they are here enjoying the ceremony tonight. So, of course, they'll be listening in from Pulse, streaming in, and we'll be here throughout the next hour. 
Back to Pulse tonight where the ceremony to honor the 49 victims started moments ago. We will take you there live with a speech from Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer very shortly. This five-year remembrance is happening at two locations simultaneously. We want to check in now with Nadine Giannis at the Dr. Phillips front yard where everybody is welcome to watch the ceremony. And it's also the place that some of the family members purposely chose instead of going to Pulse. Nadine, you're talking to some of those family members. Uh, Eric, understandably so, for some families, they don't want to go back to the scene of where their loved ones were gunned down five years ago. Instead, they want to be here with the community where we got the name Orlando United five years ago as thousands gathered together in this very front yarn. Uh, what we know is the families would rather feel that love. But I did also speak to a family member, uh, Lali Santiago Leon, yesterday at Pulse, getting ready for this memorial today. She was uh, literally shaking, putting up a poster of her cousin. And I had met Lolly years ago at the ringing of the bells, and, and I have never seen her this upset. She says five years, she hates using the word, but five years is a milestone. And for some reason this week was harder for her, but she says she never wants her cousin or any of the 49 angels to be forgotten. Angels, Luis Daniel Wilson Leon or Danny, and he was uh, my cousin, but uh, as we say, primo hermano, so like a brother to me. When I came up to you, your hands were shaking. Yes, they were. <laughs> you are a ball of emotion today. Yes, all over the place. Given the fact that it's been five years and it's just now hitting me, just driving here, um, it was hard because uh, it does bring back, it triggers certain memories. I came here running looking. Of course, I was held back because at this point mm -hmm. it was closed and that's why I call it a long day mm -hmm. because we were here all day, night, waiting. Where's Donnie? Where is he? Mm -hmm. So, which later that evening it was confirmed as well. So that, that, that's very hard. It's definitely been emotional. I miss him. We all do. I don't want him to be forgotten um, because I don't want this to happen again. I think that just making sure or ensuring that his legacy, as well as ever, all, all of them, are not forgotten is just, it's just important because it helps educate all of us and all of our future generations. Their impact on the world. And they won't be forgotten, which is why we're here today at the Dr. Phillips Center with this memorial, this remembrance ceremony. 1,500 people here, Eric, at the Dr. Phillips Center right now, um, and more are welcome. And just thinking back, when I spoke to Lolly yesterday, Eric, it was for the first time I've never seen her this way. And so the five years seems to be hitting families differently. And I know for all of us, we feel the same way in a sense of where, uh, you know, last year we couldn't gather because of COVID. I was at Pulse and we had to do social distancing and families and survivors couldn't get close together. And so now five years later, here we are. And I'm, and I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but you could see that the families are feeling it tougher than ever this year. And, and Nadine, absolutely. And, you know, as we've been talking to these families and the survivors in the past few weeks, it, they, they gave us the sense that leading up to this day and this night was going to be very, very difficult for them. And, you know, as evidenced by the young lady you just talked to. Very difficult for them. And, you know, it seems like as we led up to this week, there were so many events and we saw, you know, people donate blood again. And I will tell you, when, when we were working that morning, it was just incomprehensible what was happening as the news was coming in. And I will never forget, we heard one, one blood say, we need blood. And then the very next image that we saw coming in through our TVs from our live feeds are thousands of people lining up to donate blood and that was amazing that was a moment that we have to remember and that was amazing so I just hopefully we hold on to that and hopefully the families can remember that we're there for them as well
And, and Nadine, I, I know that was the feeling from so many people that that was what they could do right afterwards. And that, that's what they did. We saw the one blood uh, truck around today all over Central Florida. Thank you so much. I know you're going to stay out there for us uh, as this ceremony continues. Mayor Buddy Dyer, who was front and center in the days after the massacre, leading the city through this, is now speaking. Let's go to him. I took the phone and called my 26-year-old son at the time to make sure that he was home and in bed because the Pulse nightclub, I didn't know if he'd ever been there or not, but he could have been there because everybody was accepted and welcome there. Fortunately, he was at home and it was easier for me to go do the things that I need to do. So to me, sometimes it feels like that was just yesterday. And then other times it seems so far ago, long ago. And we've had so many additional events occur since then. I got up this morning and found out 13 people have been shot on 6th Street, 6th Avenue in uh, Austin, Texas this morning. So it just seems to go on. But the tragedy has impacted so many of us in seen and unseen ways. And I know it elicits different emotions for different people. And for me, it's a day to honor the 49 angels that were taken and celebrate the resilience of the survivors and the victims' families, the Orlando Police Department, the Orlando Fire Department, all of the first responders that joined from neighboring agencies on that day, and of course the great medical professionals that saved so many lives that night. And it's also a day for us to recommit to honor them with action. Many of us uh, gave blood this week is one way to honor them in action. And the day that I gave blood, we came out of the blood mobile and there was a rainbow in the Orlando fountain, as it turned out, Orlando City Hall. So I know that healing is not linear for everyone. There are some people that the healing started the day after. There are some that the healing may start today and only today. And that's why we continue to support our Orlando United Assistance Center in partnership with the LGBT Plus Center to provide personal services and especially mental health support and our commitment is to always support those uh, that are affected by the Pulse tragedy. So to the 49 grieving families and the survivors and the first responders, let me be clear. We in Orlando have your back. We will do everything in our power to make sure that you have the support that you need. The five-year mark we knew was going to be difficult, just like the first year was, and it's coming in an incredibly challenging year with a pandemic that caused so much loss, divisive politics at the national and state levels. We had to protect one another and support neighbors in need and reflect on the le legacy of systemic racism and find community-driven solutions to disrupt that cycle of discrimination. So United Orlando was our call to action five years ago, but we need to make, live up to it so that we ensure that it isn't simply a slogan that we trot out once a year to mark the tragedy. Instead, we want to be part of a core commitment for real change, honoring the 49 angels with action must be part of what we do as a community. So it's important to recognize that the Pulse tragedy disproportionately impacted LBGTQ+, Latinx, black and brown communities, and all communities of color. And these are the same communities that are now getting targeted by dangerous political rhetoric and hateful policies I hate to say it, but especially at our state government level. And I want you to know that the city of Orlando is committed to continuing the work to ensure that every single person who calls our city home feels equally valued, equally protected, and has equitable access to opportunities to help them not only get by, but to thrive in our community. So at City Hall, a few of the things we've done We've installed an all-user multi-stall restroom to ensure that anyone can use the bathroom without fear of harassment, a pretty simple thing to do. We passed a resolution to increase access to opportunities for LGBTQ plus business owners. And over the last few weeks, we've flown a transgender pride flag and a progress flag over City Hall. But our work is not done. The journey to equity and inclusion is a long one, and we need to continue to work every single day. So we will not let win, hate win, not here in Orlando. We are Orlando United. Thank you for being here.
Mayor Dyer talking about how he has made it a priority to make Orlando in particular an inclusive place. And News 6's Troy Campbell is out there, and he was there during the speech from Mayor Buddy Dyer, also talking about how healing, in his words, is not linear. We have seen that over the five years, and especially in the weeks as we were speaking with Nadine about this, leading up to today and this remembrance ceremony. Troy, healing, again, is not linear. We've heard that from so many of the victims and so many of the survivors. And Eric, what the mayor went on to say is he was recommitting that the city will provide resources for survivors to make sure that they do have all of that mental health counseling that they need. Yesterday, I did speak with Orlando City Commissioner Patty Sheehan, who said that she's concerned uh, that currently there's not enough money being allocated uh, for their survivors to make sure they do get the proper mental health care they need. But like you said, he mentioned the five-year mark, a lot of other things in context compiling on that, being in the middle of a pandemic, and also the fact of how we've seen the politicalization of gun violence following this tragedy as people were just trying to heal in themselves and then they kind of watched it play out on a national on a national stage so again uh, the mayor once again committing that Orlando is a place of inclusion um, he of course stood out here during those updates that we would get um, in the days after the shooting when I would cover that uh, following when the FBI still had this whole stretch of Orange Avenue closed off Buddy Dyer he was out here as the mayor of Orlando saying that he would bring this community together. He was making sure Orlando United was a hashtag uh, that was being shared across the world. And he says, you know, nonetheless, five years later, the commitment must still be there and must still be strong and that our work is not done. Um, and of course, we expect to hear from other people out here, but um, Mayor Dyer also, he helped lead the first um, gathering they had at Lake Eola. Uh, that was about a week after the shooting, had about 50,000 people that came out at Lake Eola. He once again reiterated how that was set up by a few 20-year-olds who didn't know how many people would show up. But again, people coming out showing how they are committed um, and showing how we can all come together as a community. Eric. And, and Troy, it wasn't rhetoric when you were out there in those days after with the mayor and in all of those press conferences and those updates he would give. That hasn't faded in the five years since. And for a lot of it, in all fairness, for a lot of these politicians, they weren't used to dealing with the LGBTQ community. Maybe they had a family member, uh, maybe they had a friend. But this really put them in the midst of those issues, which really forced them to learn and educate themselves on how those issues can affect the community, which he again recommitted that. Eric. All right, Troy Campbell, thank you again. And right now, the Orange County Mayor, uh, Jerry Demings, is speaking. He's on stage now. Remember, he was the sheriff of Orange County Sheriff's Office during this. Let's listen in. But each year that we have come to remember that tragic morning, it takes me back to a place when I first got that phone call at 2.10, 2.15 a.m. on June the 12th. My watch commander called me and shared with me that he had responded with staff from the Orange County Sheriff's Office. At the time, I was the Orange County Sheriff. And my wife heard the conversation that I was having with the watch commander. And she knew that it was something extraordinary that had occurred. I got out of my bed, put on my uniform, and responded. When I got about a block away, I encountered an Orlando police sergeant and an Orange County deputy sheriff. When I looked those two individuals in their eyes, I saw something that I had only seen in the eyes of law enforcement officers on some very rare occasions. I saw fear. I saw pain. I saw blank stares. And as I responded into the scene, I had the opportunity to encounter one of the survivors. And I remember looking into the face of one of the survivors. And I saw that same 
look that I had seen in those law enforcement officers. So I knew things were bad. Uh, as we proceeded that morning and working with the Orlando Police Department, the FBI, and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, while it was still a very much an active shooter scene, as we were there in the command post, I remember at the time Chief Mina, now Sheriff Mina, I remember speaking with firefighters and, and others and the OPD incident commander. I remember hearing the conversation between a crisis negotiator and the subject. I remember very vividly what was going on. And I remember placing a phone call to then Orange County Mayor Teresa Jacobs, as you've heard now the school board chair. But I remember in that command post, as the scene was eventually stabilized, I do remember before any of us ever went out and talked to the media, and having a conversation with Mayor Dyer and others, what we said was that it is important to this community that we show unity, that we show that we will not be defined by this terror attack from the very beginning. And uh, it takes me back to some other emotions because it was an emotional event. Um, that Monday morning after the Sunday, I swore in some brand new deputy sheriffs. And within just a few days, a couple of them, brand new, resigned. They never hit the streets. And fast forward as we have now gone through all of what this community went through. I do remember the Monday afterwards, one of the survivors uh, came here to the scene and he had left his car. He couldn't get his car because the scene was contained. It was still controlled. And uh, media personality brought him over to me. And this young man had been inside the Pulse nightclub during the incident. Now it's a day and a half later. As he approached me, he was shaking profusely. Tears in his eyes. And he said to me he had not slept because he could not. He said every time he closed his eyes, he could relive the experience that he had endured. And I said to him at the time, I knew because of many of the volunteer counselors who were here at the scene, we quickly took him to one of them. They put their arms around him. They showed him love at that time. So here we are. Here we are five years later. None of us had a crystal ball. We couldn't imagine what would happen. We could have assumed that there would be some type of memorial site, but thanks to the One Pulse Foundation and that entire volunteer board and a lot of people, this memorial site has become a reality. It is part of the commitment that we made as a community 
that we will never forget those 49 angels and the other survivors. Even recently, I was at the Orange County History Center on Friday, going through the exhibit, and I had the opportunity to see one of our surviving families, the Alvira family, Myra Alvira and the mother of one of the 49 angels, Amanda, was there. And immediately, as we saw one another, there were no words, just love, just an embrace. So let me just say to this entire community where I was born and raised, let me just say to all of you, thank you for not letting hate win. Thank you for letting love win in this community. That's the kind of community that we all want to live in. That's the kind of nation that we all want to live in, where we respect and understand our differences as we endeavor to be the United States of America. So this evening, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before you. We have made a commitment even from Orange County government. Some of my colleagues on the Board of County Commission are here. And that $10 million down payment that Orange County made to make this memorial site what it can be, we are honored to serve all of you. May God continue to bless each one of the 49 families and the others who were impacted by this tragedy. May God continue to bless this great community that we live in. Thank you so much. Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, who again at the time was the Orange County Sheriff. This is now Barbara Palma, who is the owner of Pulse and also the CEO of the One Pulse Foundation. I am Barbara Palma, the founder and CEO of One Pulse Foundation. We are here to honor the 49 angels and their families and to pay respect and tribute to the survivors, the brave first responders, and everyone impacted by the Pulse tragedy. As many of you know, my brother John was my first introduction to the LGBTQ plus community. As a gay man, he allowed me to see firsthand at a young age what being open and inclusive truly meant. When he passed from complications from HIV during the AIDS epidemic, not only did I lose an amazing brother who I adored, but I also lost my direct connection to community that I loved. Pulse Nightclub, which was established in 2004, was also a way to reconnect to this amazing community, and it was embraced by the global LGBTQ community for the club's culture of love and providing a safe space where everyone could be themselves and be proud to bring their families. For some, Pulse was their family. Pulse stands as a testament to the strong spirit and resilience of this Orlando community. And while this year, our five-year remembrance, is considered a landmark year, we all know that time does not necessarily mean we have healed. Five years is truly not that long. Everyone seated here today is in a different place of their healing journey. Even those who outwardly have made progress will still have those moments that take them back a step or two. Those moments may be less frequent or it may be easier to rebound from, but they still occur. From those who share their stories with me, it is learning and accepting that they will never get over this, that they will always mourn the loss, that they will always remember what they endured inside that night, and that they can never unsee what they saw, forget the smells or the sounds, but that they can learn to live with it and move through it. The Pulse mass shooting was also a terrorist attack. And this was an attack that specifically impacted a community that has already been marginalized and terrorized and attacked for generations. The families and survivors and first responders have always been and will always be our first group to be engaged regarding this design and construction, opening and operation of the National Pulse Memorial Museum. They are represented on our task force, our committees, design firm selection committees, and jury. 
Ongoing listening sessions are conducted with them through every phase of the project, and we have a full-time position dedicated to maintaining strong relationships and clear and consistent communication with them because it's their participation and feedback that are in integral to the support of this project. It's always been crucial to involve the community and to give everyone a voice in helping create the National Pulse Memorial Museum. And that's been accomplished through idea generators, town hall meetings, memorial surveys, public input from the Memorial Museum concept designs, and community presentations with the design team to receive the public feedback on the design. We are setting out to do right by the people killed and all those affected by the attack at Pulse, to bring light to their darkness, to create a legacy of love. Our mission became larger than just a building, a memorial, a museum through its central and an absolute must. Our goal is to make real change, to defeat hate. In the fall of 2017, when we asked you the words and emotions that you wanted to feel when you were visiting this memorial site, you told us the following, love, hope, unity, acceptance, courage, and strength. We take these words that you gave us and apply them to everything we do on a daily basis. As you have seen for the Pulse Five Year Remembrance Week, we chose to focus on the word love, with the V being symbolic for representation of the Roman numeral number five. Love epitomizes what built Pulse Nightclub and how the community and the nation and the world responded and is still strong as it was five years ago. I want to recognize and thank the countless numbers of organizations and individuals who came together in remembrance and unity. Today and every day, I'm also reminded of the global response of love that we've seen in the, in the weeks and the months following the tragedy. A tribute to the ideals that our community and the One Pulse Foundation hold dear. We believe that it is our important responsibility to tell the story for future generations so that we don't ever risk a tragedy being erased entirely over time. Now, we are the keepers of the story, but in the future, it is the Memorial Museum that will continue the legacy when we're no longer here to do so. It's our mission to pay tribute to all the affected and engage and educate people from around the world, serving as a catalyst for positive change. We hope to initiate courageous conversations and give people of all ages the back and the backgrounds the tools that they need to learn about and promote acceptance. Education and awareness are central to eradicating hate and promoting real change in our society. Looking forward, we are committed to promoting acceptance, equity, and inclusion, creating safer learning communities, and providing knowledge and information on social issues at the individual, group, and community levels. Dialogue and education will always help us realize that we will not let hate win because we choose to outlove it. Thank you. News 6 anchor Julie Broughton is next. She will introduce a survivor of the Pulse Massacre, but also he is the media relations manager Hello at everyone. Quality I'm Florida. Julie Here's Julie. I'm an anchor with WKMG News 6, and I am so honored to be here with you tonight and to introduce Brandon Wolf. Brandon Wolf is a nationally recognized gun safety and LGBTQ civil rights advocate and a dynamic public speaker. He currently serves as the media relations manager for Equality Florida, the state's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization. On June 12th, like so many others, life changed for Brandon. He lost his best friends, Drew Leinenen and Juan Guerrero, during the Pulse shooting. Rather than be swallowed by the anger and fear of tragedy, Brandon set out to honor the victims' legacies with action. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Brandon co-founded The Drew Project, a nonprofit organization that works to empower youth and provide future leaders in the LGBTQ community funding for higher education. He also became an outspoken act activist in the gun violence prevention movement, and in 2019, he became the first survivor of the tragedy at Pulse to testify before Congress. Please join me in welcoming Brandon Wolf. Thank you all. And I'm sorry that it's an emotional day you know, growing up, I didn't believe that I deserved a space like Pulse. I was taught that I didn't deserve acceptance, appreciation, or love. I truly believed that the world wasn't ready 
for an out, proud, queer person of color. I internalize the idea that in order to truly belong in this world, I would have to forfeit the things that made me different. I would have to abandon the pieces of me that the world deemed just too controversial to stomach. So when I got a chance, I left home as quickly as I could. I packed two suitcases, hopped on a plane, and moved 3,000 miles away to a place I'd never been in search of a place to call home. I found it here. I found it in the vibrant and rich diversity found it in our safe spaces, spaces like Pulse. And I found it in chosen family, community. When I met my best friend Drew in 2014, I had no idea that he would change my life forever. He was audacious and unapologetic. He practiced bold self-love and existed defiantly. He was everything I believed I didn't deserve. And he was so proud of it. The first person who taught me that it's okay to love myself, all of myself. Five years ago, we were safe. We walked arm in arm into the building behind me, the refuge we could have navigated with our eyes closed. We sipped the same drinks we always sipped, twirled to the same beats we always twirled to. It was belonging. It was freedom. Everything I thought I didn't deserve. And then in an instant, it was gone. The carefully constructed walls around us crashed down the harsh glare of hatred fixed upon us. My safety, my belonging devoured by the flames of violence. Drew, his partner Juan, and 47 others were stolen from us in a blaze of gunfire. I'll be honest and vulnerable with you, I wanted to run away. Until that moment, I thought heartbreak was just a cliche, until my heart lay in a thousand pieces at my feet. I had lost the anchor in my life, and I didn't know how to survive anymore without my best friends. I found the first shred of my courage six days after the shooting. We had a funeral service for Drew that day. I was a pallbearer and I found myself clutching the side of his casket so tightly I thought my fingers might fall off because I didn't want to let go of my best friend until I'd found the right words to say goodbye. When we got to the front of that church, I looked down at his polished wooden box and I made him a promise that I would never stop fighting for a world that he would be proud of. I didn't know it at the time, but that wasn't a promise to be fulfilled by me. It was a challenge to each and every one of us. You see, a world that Drew would be proud of is one that values everyone. It's a world that protects trans kids and doesn't turn them into a political football. It's a world where the beautiful black trans women in our communities are celebrated while they live, not just memorialized when they die. You see, that world that Drew would be proud of is a world that chooses peace over violence. It's a world that chooses unity over division and love over hate. A world that Drew would be proud of is a world we can all be proud of. And it's one we must all be willing to fight for. As we sit here today marking five years since the darkest day in our community, the hardest day of my entire life, we have to recommit to the work ahead. Bigotry and hatred are not asleep. They still move around us. And if we are going to snuff them out, we must make the same defiant choice we made on this site five years ago today, and that is to embrace the power of community and reject the temptation to come apart at the seams of our differences. Growing up, I didn't believe I deserved a place like this. I didn't believe I deserved a community 
like this one, a chosen family, a home. But I was wrong. Drew's defiance taught me to demand a world where every single one of us is celebrated. This community's resilience taught me that when we choose to stand together, we are unshakable. And now, five years later, we are called upon to recommit to sharing that same message with the world, to recommit to ensuring that no one is left behind, and to honor those who were stolen from us with our authenticity, with our courage, with our resolve, to honor them with action. Thank you. That was Pulse survivor Brandon Wolf, who was also, as we said, the media relations director at Equality Florida. And next we're going to hear from the deputy chief, Jim Young, at the Orlando Police Department, who was on duty at the time and told us a remarkable story over the last few weeks. We've heard from him. We've heard from uh, some of the other law enforcement officers who have responded. We talk so much about the survivors and the families and and neglect to speak about uh, law enforcement, and uh, he's speaking next. In fact, that Pulse five-year remembrance ceremony continues live on ClickOrlando.com right now with several more speakers to come. Like we said, the Orlando Deputy Police Chief, also another survivor, and another reading of those 49 names. Thank you for staying with us as we end our on-air program. Here again are those 49 souls we lost five years ago tonight. Thank you. 
passing by I see friends shaking and singing oh. 